If you ever wondered what heaven is like, there is a book of the Bible that describes it the most. In fact, in this book, there are occasions when it actually says, a door was opened to me to see into heaven. And that is the book of Revelation. I want to ask you to open to Revelation chapter 4 this morning, the last book of the New Testament. Revelation chapter 4. And notice what the Apostle John writes in Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So again, he is now saying that here I am, and all of a sudden it's like God opens a door for me to look into heaven for a few moments. What does he see? And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit had brought him to this place. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper. Anyone familiar with this gemstone, the jasper stone? The jasper stone is a type of reddish, a, a, a red, almost a dark red, almost looks like a brown, a dark red stone. And he says, he who sat there also had the appearance of carnelian. This is another type of gemstone that almost looks like a fire red, not a brown red, but a fire red. So he looks into heaven and he sees there a throne, and the one sitting on the throne, throne has this appearance of these gems that look dark and fiery red. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. You guys have seen an emerald stone? Kind of a greenish. So there is this rainbow surrounding throne and there's someone sitting on it who has this appearance of dark and fiery red. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders. These are apparently older men. I don't know what size. He doesn't tell us how far these thrones are away but they circle the throne. There's one throne in the center with a rainbow surrounding it looking like emerald and the person seated on it has the appearance of fiery and dark red. And around this throne sit 24 other thrones. Scripture says the men seated on these thrones are clothed in white garments and they have golden crowns on their heads, John says, looking into heaven. From the throne, this throne on which the person who sits on it looks fiery and dark red, as the appearance is what he describes. From this throne comes flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. That's interesting. He looks into heaven and he sees this very, I mean, lavish setting. And from the throne, there is lightning and thunder and rumblings. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. So try to picture in our mind that an entrance way, an entryway to this throne, and these other, all these other peoples, maybe perhaps twelve on either side, and then going to the throne itself, there are torches all the way up to the entrance of it. which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. So this is what he sees. I try to picture this in our minds. Say the throne is here, and on either side we've got 12 thrones with men sitting in white garments and golden crowns on their head. 
and actually seated on the throne we have someone who has the appearance of fire and dark red. From this throne there are lightnings and thunder and there are torches on the entryway to the throne and all the way in front of the throne it looks like a sea of glass made of crystal. And around the throne, up right next to the throne where this one that's seated on it, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. This is strange. You've never seen anything that looks like this on the earth. But there are four creatures who are alive and they're standing right around the throne where the thunder is coming from and the lightning. And they have eyes in front and behind. The first living creature looks like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle. This is what they appear to John to look like. He sees one creature that looks like an eagle, one that looks like a lion, one that looks like an ox, and one that looks like a man. This is interesting just to pause to think about that, that it's almost as though all of every living creature are represented here. Anything that God's made that's alive. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, guys, John wrote Revelation, we, we understand, about A.D. 85 to 90. So this is over 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, John saw into heaven. There was a door open, and this is what he saw that there are these creatures, four of them, one like a lion, one like an eagle, one like an ox, and one like a man. And they never stop saying to the one seated on the throne, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And look what happens next. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, in, in what way are they giving glory and honor? By saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever these living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, then what happens? The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Now, this is hard for us to imagine this, but this was going on 2,000 years ago when John saw in, that these living creatures were saying this to him. And every time they finish this, these 24 elders, you say, how can this, I, it's, I don't know. This goes on perpetually. They all fall down. And they worship the one who lives forever and ever. And what do they do? They cast their crowns before the throne. I mean, these elders are obviously in an honorable position, whoever they are, whoever they represent. They are people of honor. But in comparison, when he is praised, they take their crowns and they cast them before the throne. And here's what they say. Here's what John heard 2,000 years ago. As far as we know, ladies and gentlemen, we have nothing else. That, this is a very rare door into heaven. This is going on right now. And what do these 24 elders say when they cast their throne? Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they exist and were created. Now that is one 
window, one door into heaven. And I want to think about the thing that the 24 elders are saying to God right now. They are saying to him, as you and I are sitting here this morning in 2021, August the 1st in Providence, Rhode Island, far, far away from that place. They are saying right now to the one seated on the throne, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive three things, glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. This tells me that according to heaven, there are three things that God is worthy of receiving. And these three things, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, are things that God is worthy of receiving from you. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever felt underestimated by anybody? I've had this experience. I remember when I went to Seminary. When I got, I was been a youth pastor for eight years, and then I went back to finish an MDiv. And I remember, right when I first got back there, I went to this very, very, very large church in the town, and I was very fond of the pastor. Really appreciated him. And one day, I had just got there, and that Sunday afternoon, I knew someone that lived in the congregation, and they invited me to come to their house for lunch, which was very kind of them. And I went to their house at lunch, and that day they had invited other church members to be there too. And there was this younger guy sitting there. He was going to college at the time, and, and they, I sat at the dinner table with them. And, and the people that invited me introduced me to this guy. And this guy basically just blew me off. You know, fine. You know, and I, I, it was weird. I said this, wow, I, I feel really, this guy doesn't even know me, just kind of blew me off here, you know? So we had lunch and that was fine. Went to church that night and the church was very large and it was packed and I was sitting in the back row of the congregation that Sunday evening. And when the service got done, the pastor saw me in the back row and he calls my name. He said, Ted Strickland, what are you doing here? He calls me out in front of all of them, and I said, well, you know, I'm back here to go. He said, that is great. Come on up here. So he calls me up in front of the whole congregation, gets me up on the platform, and he said some very nice things, and he had me lead the congregation in prayer to close the service. Now, this guy that day at lunch didn't know that I knew the pastor, that I, you know, I had, I'd been there before him and had relationships with these people knew me. When the service got done, who do you think of the first people that comes over and he wants to talk to you? Boy, he's nice to me. Oh, he wants to. Now this guy thinks I'm great because someone that he respected knew who I was. And now all of a sudden, in his estimation, my value as a person rose. But I never forgot that. That before he knew me, he undervalued me. He didn't he underestimated me. We all like think of experiences sometimes in life. I know people have experienced this some, sometimes in, in dating relationships. You know, they, they don't the other person undervalues them. The scripture says that God is worthy of something. Now I want to think about a few of these words in this verse. Revelation 4, verse 11 says, worthy. Okay, that word, everybody, is a word that means to weigh the value. It means to almost put something on a scale. And I'm going to put this on, and we're going to determine what this is worth. Worthy are you, God. I have actually weighed your value, and this is what you're worth. God, you are worthy of this, our Lord and God, to receive glory. The word glory is the word praise. By the way, the root word of the Greek language of the word glory is the word opinion. 
God, I have weighed your value and your worth, the elders say to him, and you are worthy to receive praise. You are worthy to receive a right estimation, a right opinion of who you are. And by the way, everybody, when I properly understand the value of something else, it makes other people understand that too. It gives them the right opinion. We've had lots of people say to us, which is a blessing, they come to you on our tours. Man, I have heard such good things about you. I came to a wedding the other night. I pulled up at, the, at this house in Portsmouth, this beautiful mansion, the Glen Manor. And the woman, I get off the bus, and she does a double take. He says, are you Ted Strickland? I said, yeah. I said, well, I've seen you on the website. And I've heard so many good things. I talked to this. He said, this guy told me good things about you. And this guy. And because of that, she had a very high opinion because of other people's praise. When you and I have personally the right opinion of God's value, and we praise him for what he is truly worth, it gives other people a high opinion of him. And God is worthy of of the proper estimation, a proper opinion of who he is. He is worthy of that. And who are the ones that give him that? The people who know him. They're the ones who can say, listen, I'm telling you, this person, this one, is crazy. The Bible says this is something that God is worthy of. He is worthy of right praise, a right personal opinion that gives other people a great opinion. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive praise and to receive honor. The word honor is the word respect. God, I have a high respect. I have a of your awesomeness, of your greatness, and in, in me, that produces in me a real respect for who you are. God, you are worthy of this. You are not, you are not someone not to be highly respected. You are worthy from my life to receive praise and to receive respect. As I, as I think about you and weigh you in the balance, I say, okay, it is worth this much. It is worth praise. You are worth praise. You are worth the highest respect. And he says, or they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. This means when, when you got this God is worthy to receive this means he is worthy to receive from me and you confidence in his strength. The word power in the Greek language is the ability to do something, the ability to perform it. God has it, and he's worthy to receive from me and you confidence in his ability. God, because I know who you are, I don't underestimate you. I don't undervalue you in this world. But in this world, I have a proper estimation of you. And because of that, I praise you highly. I praise you all the time. I also give to you respect, high esteem. And I also give to you confidence in your ability. I am confident in your strength. God, you are worthy of that. Anything less than that is unworthy. You do not underestimate. You are underestimated. And why is it that God is worthy of your proper praise and respect and confidence in his ability? Why is he worthy of this from you? For this reason. For you created all things. God, I, I, I have eyes. I have ears. I have a nose. I can look around me. I can look at this massive, wonderful world that I live in. How dare I not praise you every single day of my life? I have no control of the breath that comes out of my lungs. You're the one who gave us the breath of life. And while I have it, like the psalmist says, while I live, 
I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Anything less than that, you underestimate God. You're undervaluing him. If your life is not a life of praise, it's because of one reason. You underestimate who God is. You undervalue him. That is unworthy of the Lord. It is unworthy of the Lord for you as a human being not to be giving him praise as the, as the, as the daily habit of your life. It is not worthy of the Lord. It is beneath him for you and I not to not hold him in the highest respect. To understand as we spread on Wednesday night that God's, God is every in every place beholding the evil and the good and he's awesome. And because of that, his presence, his great grandeur, should produce in me the highest respect, causing me to turn away from what is evil and do what is good because I respect this awesome and great God. He is worthy of that. And if I don't have that hard attitude, it's because I underestimate him. I don't properly value who he is. And if I knew him better, I wouldn't do that. And it also should prompt in me an absolute confidence in his ability I am confident in your strength, God, because I see what you have done in this universe. And anyone that can do that can take care of my small situation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about faith the last couple of weeks. Remember I said last Sunday that faith is when you believe the world is as Jesus says it is. The truth is what he says it is. The future will be what he says it will be. Do you believe everything he said? It's like the Apostle Paul said, Take heart, men, for I have faith that it will be exactly as I have been told. I am persuaded of this. Now, if you have that kind of confidence, then you and I are going to walk. One thing that's going to definitely do in our lives is going to cause us to be serious about prayer. Because we are confident in God's ability. Anything less than that is unworthy of God. If I have a meager prayer life, I, I underestimate him. If my life is not marked by the fear of the Lord, which is by far the majority of people, and again, once again, as I drive in this morning, I see all kinds of people out walking, they're going to go off to brunch. They underestimate God. They don't give him the respect he deserves. Their life is not about praising him. God, I can't believe all that you've done in the universe. You are worthy. I have weighed you. And you are worthy of glory and honor and power. Confidence in your strength. Because you have created all things. Guys, is our life giving the right opinion of God to other people? We claim that we know him. We claim that we're Christians. And yet so many of us walk around frustrated and angry and depressed. And where's the value of your God? Don't you see? Is your life giving the right opinion of me? God is worthy of a life that gives a right opinion of him. God, you've been nothing but good to me, period. You are worthy of praise. You are worthy of my highest respect as I live my life on a daily basis. And you are worthy of receiving from me absolute confidence in your ability. Because you have created all things, and because of your will, they exist. Guys, there's one reason why you're taking your next breath right now. There's one reason why you're... Your pulse is going right now. God's will, that's it. I was thinking about that recently. You know, sometimes as we all live our lives, and you're going around your daily, and it's sometimes, again, life's involved with a lot of mundane things at times. And you wonder sometimes, what is the point of it all? Especially, let's say, if you're disappointed in some area of your life, you're waiting on something and nothing seems to be, and you feel in your heart, what's the point of it? Here's the point of it. It's because of God's pleasure and his presence 
that life takes on significance and meaning because who is the one who wills you to be here? He does. And that gives your life incredible value. You know who wants you here? The creator of the universe. Now, if that's, what, if that's all you need to know, and if it means a lot to him that where he chose to put you in this world and the family he gave you and the color of your skin and the talents that you have and also the concerns you have and all this interesting story of your life and the fact that you live in that life and you praise him, the fact that you live in that life and you respect him, the fact that you live in this life and whatever's going on, you're giving him confidence in his ability. Man, that's what he wants. And your life is worth it. Because it's his will that you exist. Now guys, God is worthy to receive from our lives these things. Praise and respect and confidence in his ability. And anything less than that is just like the guy who didn't know me and he underestimated me until suddenly he had a better idea. God is not underestimated in heaven. He is underestimated here. My question is, is he underestimated by you? Does your life reflect a proper estimation of God? Man, when you hear that, that you have a chance to come together with other human beings and praise God together, to lift up your voice to him, to enjoy him, to acknowledge his greatness, if the only reason why you show up to do that is because someone's making you do it or because you really know you should do it, you underestimate him. You in your heart don't get it. If you knew him better, you would be running through there. You couldn't wait to get here on a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night. And get here on a Wednesday night and say, God, I have confidence in your ability. But we got a lot of things going on in the world. We got people in this church that have needs. And things going on, Christians outside of here are being persecuted. We got people who need to be born again. And we have confidence in your ability, God. I don't care what else is going on. I'm going to be there because I have confidence in you. You're worthy of that. But sadly, there are a lot of times, obviously the world, again, does not estimate them right. They underestimate them. But that certainly should not be God's own people. Scripture says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. He who comes to God must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who seek him. Do you have this kind of confidence in him? The Bible says in Psalm chapter 38, 33, Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Psalm chapter 96, verse 7, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people, Ascribe, the word ascribe means assigned to him. Give him credit for this. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Come on, everybody. That's what God is worthy of. Anything less than that, I don't know his value. What is God worthy of receiving from you? Praise and respect and confidence in his authority. That's what he's worthy of receiving. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to rightly estimate you in our lives. We have a brief window into heaven in this chapter. And we see that the people that really know you, they're the ones who say, 
they praise and they respect and they have absolute confidence in your ability because they know you. Lord, I pray that you'll receive from us on earth, that it will be an echo of heaven from our lives and from our little homes and our little house and our little life, Lord. There will be an echo of glory and honor and strength. We ask, Lord, that you would give us lives as we trust and know you better, that do not underestimate and undervalue you, and that give other people a right opinion. We pray this in Jesus' name.